So today our topic is peacekeeping, peace building, and disarmament. And with some mention of R2P, responsibility to protect as well. And we're very fortunate to have Richard Ponzio, a clear expert in this field, um, to be our speaker today. And I'll just read a little brief bio of Richard. He is currently director of the Just Security 2020 program and a senior fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. Previously, he directed the global governance program at the Hague Institute for Global Justice, where he, in partnership with Stimson, served as director for the Albright Gambari Commission on Global Security, Justice and Governance. And any of you who have read or looked at that report, Richard is the primary author of that report. He brings expertise in the areas of global and national democratic institution building, global political economy, and the role of international institutions in responding to state fragility, global financial volatil volatility, and population displacement. Um, I know he's an expert on peacekeeping, especially in Afghanistan, where he spent quite a bit of time. And Richard is also an advisor to the Workable World Trust and a very dear friend of mine. And so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker. I think what I will do at this point is mute all, and then Richard, you unmute yourself. That way we can hear you very clearly during your presentation. Although no one seems to be making a lot of background noise, so that's great. But let's see, I'm gonna mute all. And let me just <clears throat> make sure I'm clear to you, Nancy. Yes, Good. Uh, very clear. Excellent. Yes. Um, okay. So everyone's muted, but you can all unmute yourself. Oh, yes, I guess I'm not muted yet. So that's good. You can hear me still. Um, Richard, do you not uh, unmute yourself? Otherwise, I can do that. I'll unmute you. you. Unmute you me because I'm <clears throat> still getting up to speed with Zoom. So thank you so much. It's truly a pleasure to be part of the uh, book club series. Uh, we're all big fans, I think, uh, on this call with uh, for Joe uh, Schwartzberg, uh, late great Joe our friend and and this book uh one of the uh pinnacle contributions he's made to uh, our movement and 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 his uh you know crowning achievement over over many decades of commitment to the peace and justice community so we're absolutely uh thrilled to contribute to this discussion and what i thought um i do is draw in particular on the excellent study guide that nancy and the team have put together because as you know it has some great discussion questions, and I'll break up the presentation in uh, parts so that we can have a dialogue and, and, and draw on the excellent study guide. Uh, the first half, uh, I'd like to really emphasize um, these key concepts of peacekeeping, peace building, a little bit on uh, disarmament and arms control, and then this R2P, which you'll see fits nicely with uh, current debates about peacekeeping and peace building. If time permits, at the end, I'd like to reference the uh, program that I'm in still intimately involved in. Uh, some of the pro proposals, I would say, which build upon, not nearly as ambitious, but try to move in the same direction as uh, Joe's uh, thoughtful uh, proposals in the areas of uh, the future of peace building and peacekeeping in particular, and also R2P and its uh, implementation since its adoption in 2005 uh, at a UN World Summit. Um, the uh, proposals that Joe highlights in particular, we'll have time to drill into, which I hope everybody has given particular attention to, a UN Peace Corps, uh, which has had many forms in uh, CGS circles for, for decades, rapid reaction, rapid deployment forces. There's been different names, but he's got, made some really important contributions to thinking on that important concept. And then a UN Administrative Reserve Corps, the peace building, civilian side uh, to peace operations, working in fragile, conflict-affected states. <clears throat> I thought I'd begin with a little historical background on these major concepts which builds on uh, Joe's chapter, the, the record to date section, pages 228 to 235, and then uh, the emphasis on attempts at reforming the existing, the current system, pages 235 to 243. Uh, many people on this call will know uh, peacekeeping uh, was not part of the original UN Charter, which I've been going through today because there's many references, especially to uh, chapter six and seven of the UN Charter in Joe's chapter, uh, this particular chapter of transforming the UN system. But uh, the great Lester Pearson, foreign minister at the time of Canada, 
in the mid 50s at the time of the uh, Suez crisis, uh, later became his country's prime minister. He was the driving force for using uh, the world's, or initiating the world's first large scale UN peacekeeping force to de escalate the situation in the uh, Sinai Peninsula. So that was uh, there in the mid 50s. Uh, of course, the creation of the UN, uh, both uh, Madeleine Albright's father, Joseph Corbell, and his work on Kashmir. And then, of course, the creation of Israel in 1948. There were small observer missions created in both of those situations at the time, forerunners to modern day peacekeeping. But it was really the Suez Crisis and then the DRC, the Congo, when uh, uh, the late great uh, uh, Dag Hammarskjöld died mysteriously in a plane crash. We all know the story. That, that was a major UN uh, peace operation at the time. Um, Fast forward to today, 14 peace operations, 110,000 uh, peace oper uh, uh, 110,000 peacekeepers, blue berets, and it's about an annual budget uh, hovering around 7.5 billion, which comes out to less than 0.5 percent of global military spending. We're going to spend a bit of time today talking about with Joe's proposal how the Peace Corps idea would be about three times that uh, in terms of cost, but still a fraction of world military spending today. On the peace building, uh, it it's really doesn't come around as a concept. Uh, the scholar from Norway, Johan Galtung, is credited with coining it in the early uh, 1970s, emphasis on structural causes of violence. This is where it gets its emphasis on economic and social factors rather than the core peace uh, uh, factors of violent conflict associated more with interstate conflict from peacekeeping and, and previous uh, thinking and the focus of the UN. Now we're starting to move what becomes the emphasis on intrastate civil wars. Uh, by the 1990s, the first major push with peace building and the current way we use it today comes out of uh, the Agenda for Peace document, Boutrous Boutrous Ghali, which by the way has uh, one of the first uh, uh, references or, or commendations of the uh, Joe's book is by Secretary General Boutrous Boutrous Ghali, be sure to see that. But uh, in addition to these concepts of preventive diplomacy, peacemaking, peacekeeping, uh, the concept of post-conflict peace building really gets uh, some wind in the sails when Boutrous Ghali defines it as comprehensive efforts to identify and support structures which will tend to consolidate peace and advance a sense of confidence and well-being among people. Um, so this is the beginning 1990s of not just bigger peace operations, but what are often called multi-dimensional peace operations with large civilian components within the Department of Peacekeeping, let alone uh, the, the new generation of activities for 32 programs, funds, agencies, the development agencies led by UNDP, uh, working with the international financial institutions, um, taking on a whole bunch of new civilian tasks in uh, fragile conflict-affected settings. Uh, those are the operations across Sub-Saharan Africa, the Balkans, Haiti, East Timor, that many of us are familiar with on this, on this uh, discussion today. Um, the next innovation, which uh, in a, uh, Joe highlights in the book as being significant for peace building, the peace building architecture created in uh, 2005. This is the UN 60th anniversary summit. And the architecture consists of a commission, intergovernmental body uh, that advises the Security Council and General Assembly Small Peace Building, Building Support Office, which was my last UN assignment, 2007-89, and uh, Carolyn McCaskey was the first Assistant Secretary from, from Canada, and a Peace Building Fund. Um, we'll have time to, I think, talk about this in connection with Joe's proposals, I think, in our discussion, but just to say emphasis on coordination of a whole range of actors within and outside the UN, uh, resource mobilization, keeping the eye on these fragile states long after peacekeeping has wound down, and uh, policy and knowledge development uh, really pushing the frontiers of the concept of peace building, uh, dealing with the whole conflict continuum. There's a lot of association today with conflict prevention and peace building. And that is a good segue to the last big concept, R2P. Uh, many familiar with uh, the humanitarian debates, well, throughout the Cold War, but into the 90s, uh, humanitarian intervention comes on strong. Think about uh, Secretary Albright's arguments for the intervention in Kosovo, which didn't have a uh, Security Council endorsement originally, but it sort of in retrospect happened when, when um, or after the fact, when uh, the UN mission in Kosovo was established. Um, 
and, and so they had the support of the Russians and others who had, would have vetoed uh, an intervention earlier. But this all led to um, thinking that we need to get beyond just uh, the, the intervention of outside military forces. It's so important to note that the work coming out of the Independent Commission on uh, Intervention and State Sovereignty, which uh, Joe refers to, and it's in the study guide as well, in 2001, and that was spearheaded by Lloyd Axworthy, the president of the World Federalist Movement when he was uh, Foreign Minister of Canada at the time, but it has three pillars. And the first pillar, of course, is that uh, countries are first and foremost responsible for protecting their uh, civilians. Uh, the second pillar is not about intervention yet. This is still about the capacity building and support that the international community can provide to all governments uh, so that they fulfill their obligations to protect their own civilians. It's only the third pillar and, and very carefully worded as when all options are exhausted that military uh, authorization is warranted by the Security Council. There's a responsibility to intervene to stop uh, bloodshed and, and um, the uh, threats to innocent to civilians. Um, you know, uh, we'll come to it in the discussion, I think, today, but uh, I think Joe's really talking about military authorization. Uh, that, and, and that's just a component within pillar three of the concept that um, there hasn't been further authorization since the Libya, the one that gets a lot of attention in 2011. Um, but as I will show, there have been many other uses of R2P since 2011, which often get overlooked. Now, turning to the study guide and, and really um, what was circulated today, the bottom of page one, I won't go through <clears throat> all the key issues under the first segment, peacekeeping and peace building. But just to note that in this first section, uh, as it relates also nicely to the book, chapter, uh, chapter pages 226 to 228, the peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, Pacific settlement of disputes. This is all under chapter uh, six of the charter. And besides the critical measures that we're familiar with of um, the good office of the secretary general mediation, and this is what his representatives do in these peace operations. They create stable setting to get the combatants to sit around the table and talk through their issues. Th that, that critical chapter of the charter also deals, and I know these are other chapters of Joe's book, but the ICJ and the ar arbitration work that Maya on this call knows so well, even the ICC, you can be, one can argue, can be part of conflict prevention today. But, um, uh, you know, for peace building and peacekeeping operations, Joe is absolutely right to single out, you know, what happened to the emphasis on Article 33 in Chapter 6 of the Charter. Uh, and then I'll, I'll briefly highlight, jump to point three, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, very important that regional organizations have an adequate role. Uh, and here I would refer to um, all the cool work going on in Africa today with uh, hybrid missions between the UN and a African Union in the case of Darfur, for instance, a joint peacekeeping operation. A lot of work on conflict prevention uh, between the sub-regional organization called ECOWAS in West Africa, but also in Central Asia. Uh, there are different regional bodies, but working closely with the UN and early warning uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, point five in the study guide, uh, authorized are seldom adequately funded. So yeah, this gets starting to lay the basis for the UN Peace Corps idea and that uh, missions have unrealistic mandates, point six there, they're insufficiently clear. You know, so many of them say now uh, standard language is protection of civilians. If you're gonna do protection of civilians, which links very nicely to responsibility to protect, <laughs> it's going to cost a lot. It's a very ambitious undertaking, and you're going to put your own peacekeepers, let alone civilians, international staff, in harm's way. Uh, exit strategies are also something uh, that are, are left undone. The important thing, uh, and, and Joe notes, is how peacekeepers used to be from around the world, but especially even the global north, the Nordic countries, Canada, they're no longer in the peacekeeping game. South Asians, Sub-Saharan Africans are the major contributors. Something to keep in mind if you build up a standing, a new kind of UN Peace Forces to advocates. Uh, and then last points, yeah, Joe is correct in point 11 of the study guide uh, about his criticisms about the meager budgets and authorities of the Peace <coughs> Commission. That's something we wholeheartedly concur in our work uh, in the albright Kambari Commission. And we'll come to some of those specific ideas in today's discussion. And let me conclude with, um, the final point on the failure. So this was the point I was saying earlier that Joe has singled out the failure to use R2P doctrine since Libya. 
he is specifically talking about military authorization. Because in our own research, in uh, just in the last few weeks for a meeting we held in, in Doha, Qatar last month, we unearthed that the UN Security Council has invoked R2P 54 times since 2011 in the Libya intervention, and the Human Rights Council of the UN has invoked it 30 times. Uh, so, you know, they're really referring to these pillars <clears throat> and how it's really the responsibility of the governments and, and the UN can provide political and capacity building support, but only when uh, all options are exhausted do you consider, you know, the responsibility of the Security Council to author authorize an intervention. Uh, as we've seen in the most difficult conflict of the last decade, uh, Syria, so many attempts, uh, but we were blocked by vetoes or threatened vetoes to help uh, Syrian civilians, and that's why we've had, that's part of the reasons we've had the, the level of destruction that we've seen. So I'll stop there, but turn to the first uh, set of questions and really just highlight the first question on Article 33, the Pacific Settlements of Dispute article in that whole chapter six of the charter, and, uh, and throw out for discussion, you know, why have these different tools, uh, mediation, arbitration, judicial settlement, the use of the ICJ, why have they often been ignored? and what might improve the likelihood of utilizing these diplomat diplomatic methods. And keep in mind, uh, in the next segment, we'll come to specifically the UN Peace Corps and the administrative, uh, the peace building proposal that Joe has. So we'll have plenty of time to talk about interesting, innovative ideas from Joe and, and related ideas that we've put forward in our own research. So I'll stop there though to get the discussion going. Okay, great, and I have unmuted everyone, although some people are still muted. I suppose that they muted themselves. And I see that Ron Glossop has joined us by phone. Welcome, Ron. Yeah, I, I tried to get through Zoom and I just couldn't, so I'm on the phone. Okay, we'll, we'll experiment with that in between calls next time. That would be great. So I guess you're throwing out a question to us or a discussion point, Richard? Yeah, and it's, it's uh, a fundamental 30. starting point, you know, before you get to creative ideas of what should be changed in some of Joe's very ambitious ideas, uh, Peace Corps and, and uh, the administrative uh, response, I want to get the exact wording of his administrative reserve corps, so civilians in fragile conflict effective settings. Before we get to those specifics, what you like about those proposals, I think it's important that we get at the current system and why isn't uh, chapter six in the peaceful settlement of disputes being adequately implemented? And we're not just talking about uh, the last couple of years in Syria, but you know, use your, put your historical caps on and give us your thoughts about since the founding of the UN, what happened during the Cold War, but also these last 25 or year, so years since the end of the Cold War. I, I, I was just stopped to hear you say that over 50 times responsibility to protect has been invoked uh, since Libya. I'm like, huh? Why, why didn't I hear anything about that? I'm supposed to be informed here. So I would like you to elaborate. That sounds like what he's talking about. It, it, maybe it isn't negotiations to end conflict, but it, what are those interventions that are non-military that are put under that rubric? Uh, please el elaborate, such as. And that was David Landell speaking. Maybe if your video's not on, you could say who you are, especially then. Thank you. No problem. Great. And, and you know, this, in case some are wondering, or we're going to get through the whole study guide today, uh, probably we'll cover the first half in detail with the presentation that will follow. But do know that the last part of the study guide and elements of uh, this chapter 12 from the book deal heavily with the R2P concept that, David has flagged. And, you know, there are uh, many peacekeeping missions, as I said, 14 going on, some big ones in Mali, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, though that's wound down uh, in, um, oh, I see uh, Nancy has frozen. I hope I have not frozen and everybody can still hear me. Um, we can hear you. Good. I, you, yeah. you just froze on the screen. But, but to continue that, so with, uh, you know, the protection of civilian mandates, and uh, the ability to use force under, you know, Chapter 7, enforcement operations, those missions continue and, and they have that capability and they're part of this new generation of what is often called robust peacekeeping, unlike the 
peacekeeping that I grew up on in the 90s, you know, they, they have more yeah, firepower and the ability certainly to do force protection, protect them, their own selves. In places like Mali, there's a big overlay with the war on terror. There's uh, elements from Al Qaeda and, and uh, of course, the Islamic State now. So you can imagine, um, and counterterrorism language is in the mandates and it's intermingled with, with R2P and protection of civilian mandates. So in other words, um, if you're worried, David, that you know, the UN is not taking seriously its uh, obligation uh, to protect civilians in the most difficult situations and to arm its peacekeepers and to give its abilities, that is happening, has been happening, and certainly since uh, the Libya intervention, which gets all the attention because as I didn't elaborate, but, but uh, Joe wisely does, and it's in the uh, end of the study guide, um, it's the association with regime change. Omar Gaddafi, <laughs> we all probably agree, bad guy, um, but the uh, reason for uh, stopping uh, his forces was not to overthrow his regime. That was an effect that happened as a result. Uh, the intervention strengthened the rebel forces and they overthrew Muammar Gaddafi in the end. But now Russia and China, they, they, one of the reasons they won't allow military authorization using the language R2P is because Russia and China now uh, are suspicious that there's always a Western agenda of regime change. They want to topple people they don't like who are not in their camp, not in their uh, sphere of influence. And it's almost Cold War real politique thinking yet again, some things haven't changed. But R2P being invoked 50 times, that's as much to uh, talk about these other pillars and uh, the role uh, the international community can play in just supporting governments to fulfill their obligations, especially in these post-conflict set settings where states are fragile for many years, if not decades. That's why we set up the peace building architecture. Uh, that's why the Human Rights Commission is, you know, got some value out of mentioning it many times saying, you know, uh, but they're really talking about governments themselves, sovereign states having the first and foremost responsibility. And, and when Joe says it's not being utilized, he's specifically talking about the military authorization component, which is one aspect of the third pillar of R2P. I hope that's somewhat clear. And Richard, you said, I believe it was Israel and Russia that is always suspecting that there's a regime change. China. China, China excuse so, me. And these are, China. of course, two of the most famous Perm 5 members, big countries that, interestingly, China is heavily involved in peacekeeping today. They're in uh, Africa now for the first time, the only P5 member at the moment, as far as I'm aware, with boots on the ground. They were getting involved in policing for many years. And there's talk that they want to uh, uh, have the next uh, undersecretary general for peacekeeping, which has been a French national for the last 15 or so years. They would like to take that position in the future as a representation of the uh, money and uh, staffing that they put into peacekeeping today. So, Maya, I believe I saw you raise your hand. I'll call on you in a minute. I just to follow up with what I was just getting at. I, I mean, my sense, and part, this is strengthened by Joe's book, is that the global, many global South countries also are very reticent about R2P, assuming it's sort of a empire building effort or regime change effort. Um, would you say that Russia and China are the biggest? Uh, the ones who are most concerned, or is there also that concern for the global south that is just sort of imperialism re redefined? Yeah, I'd say they all have their uh, different reasons. Uh, it, the global south raises the objections of uh, in, in, intrusiveness in one's own domestic political affairs, same arguments. You can understand when they finally got their independence in the 60s and 70s in particular, that sovereignty would be on their minds. They're in the beginning of their state building processes. And some of that has continued to this day. Western countries, they're worried about intervention just from the cost angle, whether they're, they're going to get pinned down and expected to pay for these peace operations. China and Russia, uh, they have uh, secessionist movements of their own to deal with. Uh, and, and then they're always skeptical about, you know, the West trying to reassert its influence over in, in former colonies and having imperial designs. So things that, you know, were prominent during the Cold War, they haven't gone away and there's so much talk, whether it's uh, US Russia or China Russia or any number of, uh, there's so much talk of a new Cold War emerging. 
Uh, and R2P, of course, is a concept caught in the middle of that. Hmm. Maya, are you able, should I meet, unmute you? Here, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, any question about the specific settlements of disputes in chapter six, which I think is an excellent question. The fact that we don't often hear that question raised, I think, sort of is a symptom of why it hasn't had more implementation of that. Like, Richard, what do you think of China's involvement in peacekeeping mission and engagement? What do you think is, is behind it? Or why has China? taking such a strong interest, uh, what are the motivations, you know, if there's any thoughts, I'm curious. Richard, are you able to understand, Maya? It, it sounds kind of like robotic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you understand our question? And, maybe it's so repeated. and reluctance to use, uh, you know, judicial and arbitration, things in The Hague, where Maya is based. No, 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 no. You're all on top of my, my question. My question. Why is China involved in this? I wonder if we could hear you better if you weren't using the headphones and we're speaking directly <laughs> into the speaker. No, it's oh. nothing. It's nothing to do with the headphones. Yeah. Okay. Could she type? So, so I can just type it. Yes, John. My question is, why, why do you think it's motivating China to be heavily involved in peacekeeping? Oh. What are the motivations behind that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, involved in peacekeeping. Sorry, I should have caught that. And it's now very clear. Yeah. Why, 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 Can you why, repeat, is, Richard, yeah, why has China got in, more involved in peacekeeping and is, has its eye on the Under Secretary General for peacekeeping? You know, you heard it from uh, the day President Trump became president, uh, a World Economic Forum was taking place and President Xi gave a famous speech and said, we're here to help lead globalization 2.0. And some of you might be following the Belt and Road Initiative, billions of dollars in investment around the world. In that same spirit, uh, moving into political issues, peacekeeping, they've always played a, a, a leadership role in the UN. It's been growing over the last two decades. Some call it the Asianization of the UN, it involves other Asian countries too. But China has uh, slowly but surely, you know, it has massive interests throughout Africa, uh, major aid programs. So in connection with those, it's now beefing up its contribution to peacekeeping and um, uh, support for the African Union. Same thing goes, but in totally different ways throughout the Middle East, you know, oil-rich countries, but, you know, needs of those resources. So for all kinds of geopolitical and economic regions, reasons, uh, China is uh, asserting itself, especially, you know, when the U.S. now wants to go from the largest donor, it will still probably remain the largest donor for peacekeeping, but it wants to pull back not only its... Um, what's called its assessed contribution, but it would like to see a whole bunch of missions shut down. China on the opposite side though is, is willing to increase its contributions and see a uh, more assertive UN peacekeeping, but where it has an influential role in determining the mandates and, and even having its own uh, soldiers uh, as battalions within the peacekeeping uh, mission. Okay, just a follow up question, can you hear me? No. Yes. How is how have you seen China shaping the mandates of these missions in a particular way, or is it continuing in the pattern that has been seen before, or are they shaping these missions in different ways? Like I say, or is it just how? Yeah, I mean that gets at. Can you repeat it, Richard? Uh, yeah, is China shaping the missions in a certain way. They're absolutely not playing up human rights let alone the corollary of protection of civilians, which is another way of talking about the responsibility to protect. Uh, their biggest focus, like Russia, is, uh, and like the United States, quite frankly, counterterrorism. They want to stop extremist groups that can export their ideology, let alone come and threaten uh, major powers like China, Russia, or Western capitals. Uh, the whole issue of foreign return fighters uh, this is this is their major uh, interest in getting more and more involved in the space. Certainly not uh, human rights. Certainly not the democratization, political liberalization uh, elements of these major uh, undertakings, which 
is at the heart of Joe's second idea, the Administrative Reserve Corps and what he has in mind for such a large Peace Corps. This is to really help these countries become uh, democratic societies and, and ones that take care of their people. That's not China's conception of peacekeeping as far as I can tell. Carol. So Carol Steinberg is joining us today for the first time. She lives here in the Twin Cities with me, active member of United Nations Association. Go ahead, Carol. Hi, Welcome. And all. Thank you. Um, well, I just am intrigued also with the role of China in, in, in peacekeeping. And I wonder if you could give one or two examples. And are these ongoing involvements by China? Or, um, the, ma the major one that is cited is uh, Sudan. Both uh, South Sudan, as people know, become a new state in recent years, sadly fell into civil war and conflict, and a large peacekeeping mission was needed there. There had been one that dealt with the whole North-South Sudan issues and how be that preceded the uh, division of the country into two. The other big one, of course, is in the uh, western part of Sudan, uh, Darfur, uh, a conflict that's been on the radar of many for uh, well over a decade. And now there's a joint UN uh, uh, African Union peace operation. Professor Ibrahim Gambari from our commission co-led that, uh, led that mission uh, with two hats as an African Union leader and UN leader. But that was heavily supported by China. Uh, China has been interested in um, the DRC, uh, and it's one of the largest missions there. And let's not forget, the Congo is also famous for being uh, very minerally rich, extractive industries. And uh, the, a lot of the fighting is occurring in Eastern Congo. Uh, and, and that's where a lot of the minefields are, no surprise. And China has big interests. So just follow the money, uh, oil interests in Sudan and minerals in DRC. That is a chief motivating factor. In addition to my point earlier with really in connection with Afghanistan and some other conflicts brewing in Central Asia. It's the spread of terrorism that could be linked to secessionist movements in its own country, the Uyghurs in particular, which is getting a lot of attention. The Human Rights Council put a spotlight on it recently. That these detention camps are horrible. They have over a million Uyghurs being locked up. But China is using the argument of uh, terrorism, and uh, these people are... Um, violent extremists in their country. And there's a lot of questions about that. So, so countering uh, violent extremism, terrorism, and, and uh, its economic interests seem to be the two major motivating factors. And not just of China, that's been a, a major factor for, for most of the great powers and how they view the lens of peacekeeping. When it's less important, that's, that's primarily why they allow South Asians and, and Sub-Saharan Africans, which they pay for, uh, the West pays for these missions, but but they don't put their own troops in harm's way unless they have a direct national security or direct acute economic interest. And this uh, all gets to, you know, Joe's proposal, making the case for a standing independent peace force. This idea has been floating around the World Federalist Movement for, for decades uh, because it gets beyond those types of uh, limited national uh, security, national economic interests being motivating factors. We, we want first and foremost to save uh, civilians who are in harm's way, protection of civilians to be the, the chief goal of, of most of these operations. And, and knowing then that rebuilding governance structures, making them more open, accountable societies. So that gets to the second part of Joe's proposal. But before I present that in more detail, um, I, I just want to yeah, to flag that there are good arguments to be made about the shortcomings of uh, current peacekeeping and peace building, even though there have been quite some advances that have occurred over the last two and a de half decades. Joe refers to the Brahimi recommendations of 2000 that have been implemented, uh, but not, not all of them have impl been implemented, inclu including a rapid deployment capability of countries, whether uh, rich industrialized societies or these uh, global south countries, uh, nobody is, you know, making their forces available for this six, 30 or 60 days notice, which was uh, something that Joe flagged as, as absolutely critical and, again, makes the case for why an independent capability within the UN system 
is maybe an idea whose time has come. I just want to interject here to say that, especially to let the Cincinnati group know that Mac jo Johnson from Cincinnati has joined by, by video. He was on video for a short time and now he's muted and his camera's off, but he's joined us. Um, Maya sent us a note besides the question that you were able to hear, Richard. She writes, I have some comments on the study question about chapter six and why it is underutilized and often forgotten. But as there is a problem with sound, I will wait for another time. Maya, it is true that if you tried to share with us your idea, we probably wouldn't catch it, but I would love it if you would write some brief notes and I'll send it out to the group um, because we'd love to have that. I mean, basically, Richard, you asked us that question, but that was a question I had for you. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to say anything about that before we move on. Well, and also, as the other thing I'll say is that Flo, David, David Lionel did ask a question, but Flo or Mac or Ron, we don't see you. The re those of us on video, you can just raise your hand if you have a comment or question. Those on the phone, if you have something to say, make, make a little sound and we'll, we'll get you in the conversation. Just real, real quick, there's a, Nancy, just if you, discussion is very good. I'm a big enthusiast for that, but if Richard's got certain um, material he wants to get through, you've got to limit the time to allow this discussion or he'll never get through his basic content. Just, you know, five minutes, eight minutes, whatever it is. Otherwise, we'll end up in discussion. We'll never hear the rest of what Richard wanted to tell us, in my view. Do you want to wrap up the discussion, Richard, and continue? Yeah, and this is a good segue then to the next segment where we're going to greater detail on the two big proposals from this chapter, the UN Peace Corps, and the UN uh, Administrative Reserve Corps. You know, with Maya's question about the peaceful dis settlement dis disputes, the, this kind of work happens all the time in uh, quiet, behind closed doors. That's why it's called good offices and it's supposed to be uh, below the radar, but it's, but it's happening. And, and this is something that Professor Schwartzberg emphasizes. One of the ways that you strengthen the UN's hand as a strong mediator is that there is always behind it. This is what we do in U.S. diplomacy all the time. The threat of force, uh, some kind of sanctions, some kind of penalties that can have real consequences, you know, economic sanctions or even the use of force, that's what gets people to the, to the negotiating table. So if there was this UN Peace Corps and an Administrative Reserve Corps, which, by the way, could bring in economic and social resources to bear different kinds of incentives for combatants to behave, but uh, back to the main point that Maya flagged, which is how can we strengthen the hand of the UN's mediation role where we really want it to be strengthened and to succeed. And there have been, by the way, a few innovations just in the last two years because uh, uh, strengthening uh, the UN as a force for peace and mediation has been a priority of uh, the new secretary general the last two years, uh, Antonio Guterres. So maybe with that said, uh, Nancy, I'll, I'll, I'll go into um, pages 41, or it's actually, I have the longer study guide, but the next section of the uh, study guide that deals with possible solutions, peacekeeping and peace building, and very specifically, the UN Peace Corps idea. I think this is really um, something that has been uh, of interest to uh, CGS and the World Federalist for, for some time. Uh, very specifically, and I'll just give the highlights, a, uh, and this is detailed in pages 243 to 252 of the book, a globally recruited all-volunteer elite force open to uh, well-vetted men and women. Maybe some of them would maybe already have military experience, but he's not saying that it's necessary. These people would get training and could be recruited on the open market, so to, sp so to speak. So it gets into all questions about loyalties and, uh, uh, you know, I imagine having geographic balance would be absolutely critical in the recruitment efforts. The second and third bullets are maybe the most important. It's a standing permanent force under direct UN command and control uh, and sufficiently large in scope and on short notice to be able to respond very quickly. So in the book, he gets into quite details about a number of around 300,000 that's the first thing I'll flag as uh, what's going to raise eyebrows in terms of uh, dealing with the political powers, let alone smaller countries that would say the UN has a, a permanent army of 300,000. And then later in the study guide and in the chapter, he, 
talks about um, besides some personnel issues and uh, well, I'll come back to peace building in a second, but on the um, uh, deployments, you know, he's still thinking small limited forces up to 10,000 troops, but they would be ready for rapid reaction. Unlike, you know, despite many commitments over the years, especially since the Brahimi report of 2000, uh, governments are not willing to have their uh, forces quickly deployed and, and they always have caveats in what types of situations unless their own direct national interests are threatened they won't deploy their forces so this gets to the to the major argument that would such a body be a frontline really important instrument for uh, bringing credibility to uh, uh, following through on this third pillar I have to emphasize third pillar of the R2P principle uh, and, and the mil authorization of military force, where, what would the Security Council turn to right away? This new force and particularly like battalions of about 10,000. Uh, and, and what it, uh, Joe really highlights, which gets to another tricky part of the t political debates around it, but it's really important that Joe highlights that only a simple majority of Security Council members, so we have 15 now, so I guess that would be nine out of 15, would need, uh, uh, or even eight out of 15, would need to um, uh, agree on the authorization initially, uh, and it would be for short six month periods that the Security Council would need to reauthorize for longer commitments. That's how the UN peacekeeping is done today, but you wouldn't need the permanent five, so it's veto proof. And this gets at the heart of, you know, addressing a, a situation like, Syria, where it's very clearly a humanitarian catastrophe, and there have been so many attempts to um, just condemn the Assad regime and, and take some kind of action uh, short of military action, and those have been vetoed, let alone uh, outside intervention. As we know, the great powers, Russia is there, and, and Iran inside Syria, and so are, so are the United States and uh, Turkey and others, all very much involved in the conflict. Um, Final points, you know, Brian Urquhart, many of us know as a famous uh, Under Secretary General, one of the first for peacekeeping when it started to really take off in the late 80s. And in, in his famous New York Times piece, he just talked about a small 5,000 uh, person standing UN independent peacekeeping force that would be, you know, seen as non-threatening. Now, you know, always have to look at the time period that these ideas are proposed. But there was a lot of pushback for even 5,000 uh, because it, it just smacks at the heart of, isn't it an intergovernmental organization? Are we trying to create a supranational organization? Having a military force would be one of the defining features. Uh, and, and, and Joe asks uh, in the questions about, uh, in, in the study guide, he would love to hear people's thoughts on the costs, whether you feel that it would be prohibitively high. Keep in mind that peacekeeping today, as I said earlier, 7.5 billion a year is what it's uh, uh, being discussed. So we're talking about a budget, Joe estimates, of 25 billion, more than three times that amount. But this is still a fraction of world military spending today. And if it prevents major conflicts from breaking out, including among great powers, uh, that's something that Joe flags. Would this be an instrument that would deter great power conflict? Maybe with 300,000, it has that possibility now. The UN has been mainly dealing with fragile, conflict-affected states who are considered uh, not great powers. Uh, last bit of information, and then I'll open up to the discussion. And by the way, to answer David's concern, this was the major other part of the discussion I wanted to have. If there's time at the end, I'll discuss some of the related albright Gambari commission proposals. But it was most important that we highlighted the Peace Corps and then the uh, corresponding or complementary UN Administrative Reserve Corps, uh, Joe proposes. And this gets at the heart of Boutros Boutros Ghali's post-conflict peace building concept, as I defined it earlier from the Agenda for Peace since the early 90s. Um, he's talking about a uh, all-volunteer, highly capable staff, mid-career professional. And he gets very precise. He's saying he doesn't even want these people from the global north. And I, I bet he has in mind, doesn't even want uh, China and Russia, maybe because of political reasons, but from the global south. So I think he's talking about well-trained uh, career civil servants who would be on standby and call, and, and they would serve not for an entire career, but up to 10 years duration. Um, so they're serving as a reserve corps and they can be called up 
uh, one question I had is in the book, he talks about uh, you know, additional training of several years through a UN administrative academy. There absolutely needs to be such an, an academy. Today, there's a staff college many people are familiar with in Turin, Italy. But those courses are usually four to six weeks because that's all a UN staff can at most get away from their day job. Now, we're talking about um, mid-career civil servants from countries in the global south. I think they're still going to run up against the uh, ability to somehow take leave for several years of training, let alone these long deployments. There's a lot of questions I have in, in connection with the feasibility uh, of implementing, even though the idea, I think, is sound overall. I, our own ideas, I'll just give you a, a final comment here, uh, is that, yes, we need something like an administrative reserve corps, but um, it should actually be part of the UN system and people across all the agencies, including the World Bank, the IMF, they should be uh, given the training to work in these uh, high-risk high environments and, and look at issues through a conflict lens, look at additional aid can actually exacerbate a conflict, create new sources of attention. So that's why you need to be trained in a different way. But with that said, I think a lot of the thinking behind the UN Administrative Reserve Corps makes sense. And, and then I'll finish with one of his uh, Joe's last questions from the study guide on this particular idea. What are the pros and cons of establishing such a uh, UN Administrative Reserve Corps? What significant advantages do you see if most of the volunteers are actually in the end never called to active duty. You know, he's talking about training and having these people prepared well, but uh, you know, it could be a costly venture by some of the donors behind it because they'll wonder, hey, what if these people aren't, aren't, aren't called up in the end? Is, isn't there a better way uh, to, to design the system? So it has a lot to do with its uh, pros and cons vis-a-vis -vis the existing 32 programs, funds, agencies, the UN development system, Department of Political Affairs has more and more deployments through what are called special political missions. Those are civilians doing peace building and mediation. Uh, and as I said earlier, the Department of Peacekeeping today has thousands of civilians in its operations, its field operations, doing uh, work that's not just about supporting the Blue Berets or the police components, but they're actually doing civil affairs duties. They're, they're one step removed from the development professionals so to speak. So, so there's some uh, trade-offs there of Joe's proposal of setting up a whole different reserve corps, really taking people, I believe, if I understand his conception correctly, from civil services within the global south, where I think people will have the right skill set, certainly the culture and the language training that will be useful. This is, in fact, where the UN recruits a lot of people. But Joe is saying, no, this needs to be a standing reserve corps, very professional have the right amount of training and uh, this will really up the UN's game in what is arguably its most high profile and certainly most expensive and I'll finish by saying most politically intrusive act set of activities the whole areas of state building and post-conflict peace building this is where uh, the UN's uh, whole image and credibility um, can be made or lost if it doesn't succeed so that's why these two proposals we know the book uh, covers a whole range of other issues and everybody should be concerned with climate change and with uh, weapons of mass destruction. But if the UN doesn't get uh, work in peace building and peacekeeping right, uh, this is where a majority of the UN's resources, including through the development system, they are able to raise billions of dollars every year, especially for these fragile conflict affected states. So this is why Joe zeroing in and it's no uh, coincidence that this is the longest chapter in the book because it is the highest priority area of the UN since the end of the Cold War. I'll, I'll stop there and hear people's uh, thoughts, ideas, and especially please draw on Joe's questions uh, from the study guide. Okay, opening it up for any discussion, any questions, any comments. Uh, I'd say, once again, Richard, it's wonderfully, you're so wonderfully informed about this deal for us to really get that there are thousands of uh, non-military forces, uh, personnel operating under the current peacekeeping operations is something very good for us to understand. We usually focus or hear about you know, the military dimension and not that in fact, a lot of this peace building stuff is, is already happening. So my thing is this question of, uh, I don't know whether it's an appropriate moment is the financing part. Uh, I've been on two elements, 
it, it, it's simply so long as it's a matter of donations, which will especially emphasize the Western countries, though China, I think, is beginning increasingly to engage itself here. It's a good place to contest and itself make power. But the thing is, two sources seem to be available for money and might even be not so heavy or actionable, which is one is arms transfers. There's, I don't know, a hundred some billion dollars in arms transfers happening every year. And if we took a tiny slice, now who that we is, I agree is an issue, but that seems to be viable. If we took 1% of uh, that trade as a routine taxing, as uh, most other uh, business or commerce uh, transactions, uh, expect to have a tax on them, but that doesn't and could, and that would be a, a, a source of a steady non-donation uh, financing for the UN. The other way to go, or another way to go, is to take a, a, a specific percentage of national military budgets, that they would, because the consequences of those national military's actions do affect the rest of the planet, that it's legitimate to expect some proportion of those monies to go to peace building, to neutralize uh, or provide alternatives to military options. So I, I, I guess the question is, is there any viability or how could we go about uh, getting such taxes uh, uh, or fees, however you want to call them, uh, instituted? And is there some way to have it not be exactly UN or uh, moving out of this deal that the UN can never have independent revenue raising capacity specifically in this peacekeeping mode or realm. Great. No, excellent questions. And I promise to be brief to ensure lots of discussion and further thoughts on this. Uh, what's great is Joe's book gets at the heart of what uh, I'll admit we failed or we we didn't take as seriously as we should have in the Albright and Bari Commission and countless other UN reform issues. People don't want to uh, tackle the financing issue head on because of uh, the pushback that is likely to come, whether, you know, Tobin tax, international tax transfers, and Joe gives ample attention to paying for what he admits, 25 billion is a lot of money for this peace force and let alone the Administrative Reserve Corps. Uh, uh, David, the two that you flagged, though, on one hand, I, I love the idea of taxing arms transfers because it's a kill two birds with one stone prospect. We would raise money for important peacekeeping, peace building activities that would protect civilians, uh, but uh, it, it might reduce the amount of arms transfers, which many of us understandably view as part of the problem when we give these tools of death to uh, countries, uh, corrupt dictators uh, who are, are the number one threat to their own population. They prey on their own countries, let alone terrorist organizations or rebel groups that are in it for, you know, diamond mines and, and, and not, not committed to helping the, the local population. Um, this is part of the problem. And, and we all know that the arms bazaar uh, in, in rich countries, but also uh, middle income countries, they, they're making a fortune. Uh, but we're going to run up to just like, you know, changes in the Security Council have been discussed for years, but never implemented. These are some of the uh, most tricky political uh, issues we're going to run up against. And especially when you talk about like the drawing on taking away from the military budgets. Uh, the, these, these are the most sacrosanct issues within uh, emerging countries, but within uh, the most uh, wealthy industrialized countries. In the United States, for instance, as you're probably well aware, um, our contribution to peacekeeping, while significant relative to other countries, it, it's coming out of the State Department budget, the International Affairs budget, which is constantly being threatened and under attack by the current administration. No surprise there. Meanwhile, the military, General Mattis, when he was the Secretary of Defense, others are constantly saying, well, they're saying two things. We need strong diplomacy and development, civilians, but uh, they're all pro-peacekeeping because most sensible leaders in the U.S. and, and other major countries don't want to be the world's policemen. They, if somebody has to fulfill this function, they would like to see a capable UN. So it makes total sense, uh, uh, David, to have, draw on national military budgets, but uh, you're going to run up against uh, lobbies and pol sitting politicians who are going to find that idea distasteful because they're all protecting all kinds of, you know, the whole military industrial complex arguments. 
plus um, uh, in the end, um, you know, it's only a, a small percentage that really understand, let alone care about and support uh, peacekeeping, even, even when national polls show a lot of support for the UN's work in this area, it doesn't translate uh, it, at the core of our, our body politic in, in rich countries that fund these missions uh, because they have many other competing interests and stuff. That's all I can say on that point, but I, I think those are great ideas and uh, I bet they're consistent with some of Joe's uh, resource mobilization ideas, uh, given that they're linked to peace uh, in the world, as well as funding, you know, the how do we how do we support these global public goods that we're trying to um, uh, fund and support? Uh, it, it needs to come through a capability that doesn't depend on assessed contributions or especially voluntary contributions of UN member states. We see the limitations of that year in year out. I see a hand up in uh, uh, at Tom Hastings' home. And I don't know if we'll hear you from way back there. I wonder if you need to get closer to the to your sound system. Go ahead and try to ask your question. The question was that we thought that 10 years of service was was too long in the Joe's proposal. Uh, for, uh, so. And is, how much money would these people make? They have to know about police, health, personnel management, finance, they basically need a master's degree in how to manage people. And you're asking them to go to another country where they can't speak the language, <coughs> have to be available for 10 years. Is that right? Yes, I think that's a good uh, description that was in the book. And uh, Nancy told me I don't have to agree with everything. And since I was <laughs> a civilian uh, peace builder and working with UNDP, but also the Department of Peacekeeping, and my last job was with the Peace Building uh, Support Office, and I'll come to some of those ideas with the commission. But I I'll just say that, yeah, you know, the, the general thrust of the UN Administrative Reserve Corps, it's absolutely necessary. Many of us who have done this work know that the UN uh, current capabilities are insufficient and they're absolutely to, back to the point David was saying about a, a, a steady, credible funding stream. They're really at the whims of these donors. It's mostly volunteer money <laughs> that makes sure that they can pay their own salaries, let alone have programming money to do expensive uh, economic, uh, social recovery, political institution building. Setting up a new parliament, let alone running elections, is, is a very expensive undertaking. And of course, the goal is to make these countries self-sufficient and build up a tax base. But that takes uh, years, if not decades, as we find rule of law, institution building. You know, you need highly technical trained staff. And there's an argument to be made uh, that the UN building up its own capability, it, it can subcontract from the private sector or from existing civil services. And I agree with Joe's uh, assumption that from within the global south might make the most, most sense because you're gonna get, for instance, um, there are a lot of people in Afghanistan that spoke Urdu or uh, Hindi from the subcontinent. So the big countries of Pakistan and India, they did, they, we, we, not only were they nearby countries that understood the culture and, and many of them were Muslim and were sensitive to what was going on in Afghanistan, but they, um, they spoke and they could converse a lot with uh, certainly Afghan elites because those Afghan elites were in refugee camps in Pakistan or educated in India. So the use uh, uh, beyond English was quite widely prevalent from people from civil services in those neighboring countries. I saw the same thing in the Balkans. We set up all kinds of tracks to get diaspora, but also people from neighboring countries who spoke Serb, Croatian, into Kosovo, uh, you know, they're Albanian speaking in particular, but they, most of them grew up speaking Serb Croatian. So the, the people from those neighboring countries, they bring a cultural sensitivity, languages and, and skill set that is often superior to very capable, but uh, people from outside that region who are part of the inter international civil service. So there needs to be mechanisms that are, I think, realistic in terms of when you get to the 10 year duration and long years of training, additional training, that's where I think I have some quibbles, some disagreements on how you would finesse those issues. 
but the the general thinking is sound which is you want these people to be uh, highly educated and trained and culturally sensitive and understand the languages but you need to be able to quickly deploy them uh, those first two or three years are absolutely critical for setting a country on the right trajectory uh, over time if you're successful you're, you're scaling back the size of the mission uh, and by the way, and probably some other mission has popped up, but what often happens is the civilians, they move en masse to where the next big mission is because those first two to five years, those are the, 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 the peak periods when uh, their needs are greatest. And then, you know, if they're successful, they're pulling back because the locals are taking over. Uh, but whether or not it needs some new permanent capability like an administrative reserve corps separate from the UN system uh, infrastructure that's currently there. My uh, own work, what we call new, new civilian response capability, uh, has a rapid uh, reaction civilian component, but a 2000 standby uh, a group that's similar to some of the arguments Joe makes, but the big difference is uh, they're from within the existing UN system. They get additional training and especially having a conflict lens and feeling comfortable working in uh, very uh, risky environments, places where the <laughs> lights, uh, electricity doesn't work and stuff. You need uh, something in addition to normal training these get people get to work in you know, a developing country. These are anything but normal situations. So uh, additional training is right, but I don't know if people, the UN can afford to have them go for you know, several years of training. Rather, it's usually short-term modules. And then there's a lot of lifelong learning online training uh, and being parts of communities of practice. The UN is very good about having online discussions and, 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 and encouraging their staff to constantly be updating their skill set while they're working. So there are ways of doing that. We see that in the US government and the US private sector. There's no, there's no reason that that couldn't be the case in the UN system. Uh, Mac, and I will unmute you. Let's see here, get you on the list. Okay, go ahead. Okay, now we're, we're still not hearing you though, so you probably have to turn up your own. <coughs> oh, he's still muted. There. Okay, you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. Can you turn up your speaker? Hmm. Maybe he can submit it in writing his- uh, Yeah, I- How about now? Yes, great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, as a sort of community organizer and friend of the people in my upper left-hand corner of the screen in Cincinnati is, does the immigration crisis that the U.S. is dealing with uh, even if it's not a real crisis, uh, does it provide a any kind of opening for people based in the U.S. to, um, you know, negotiate uh, some sort of incremental reform to the existing system, which is part of Chapter 12, I guess, uh, in response to us basically having to deal with the push and pull factors of immigration? I mean, climate change is a big push of people in the Iron Triangle, Central America, and Honduras, Guatemala, Salvador. You know, the agricultural system is failing from drought. People go to the cities and then, you know, go to the north. Um, does that l give us any leverage to push for any kind of incremental reform that you all can identify? Great question, because uh, whether it's the wall and the shutdown or the broader issues surrounding the immigration crisis, um, you know, this is a moment to spur debate, uh, write op-eds and, and organize ourselves in cities across the United States to draw the very important connections that you're talking about, starting with, you know, the basic one that most people are aware of who are following this closely. It's not Mexicans lately. There's a out... Uh, uh, the, the, the number of Mexicans uh, going back to Mexico are, are, are longer, are, are bigger than those coming into our country. It's from Central America, crime-ridden. These are all countries, El Salvador, Guatemala in particular, uh, 
I believe Honduras, that had UN uh, peace operations at one time for more traditional civil wars. This was caught up in the Cold War and East and West proxy wars. But, um, you know, a successful uh, ARIAS peace agreement in Central America. People thought things were moving in the right direction by the 90s. But in the last uh, decade or two, we've seen um, the criminality and the lack of governance just skyrocket. And th those are some of the key factors uh, fueling. It's a lack of jobs, economic insecurity. You see the pull <clears throat> that that drives up uh, the immigration, the push factor. But uh, it's also people's worry about basic security issues. So as it relates to this chapter on peacekeeping, peace building, it gets at the heart of the UN, one of its central mandates in so-called normal developing countries. It's still providing technical and financial different kinds of assistance for decades. It's gotten more and more involved in political institution building, uh, rule of law, state courts, making them function so they can deal with crim criminals in these societies. But obviously we're not succeeding and, and it gets to the heart of, you know, um, it's not, you know, it shouldn't be only the international community's problem and, and, and the UN in particular, but it should be, those are institutions designed to be part of the solution. So what Joe is talking about, um, you know, it doesn't even have to be in the traditional uh, insurgent movements, uh, rebel groups uh, trying to overthrow a government or what we're seeing with ISIS and uh, the Al Qaeda uh, situation in different countries, how they feed off of uh, fragile, weak states. It could be these countries in Central America um, needing, you know, a, a great rethink and uh, new compacts made with civil society so that uh, they can function and they can take care of their own. I'm sure 95% of those people wouldn't leave if they didn't have to. They're, they're leaving so much and taking such great risks, as we know, just the traveling to uh, our southern border. So we, we have to make that case. And then on the other point, which is, <laughs> if you think what's happening in Central America and the major push-pull factors are, are, are bad enough, are complicated, it's climate, what you've put your finger on. And my friend Maya on this call, uh, the new work she's doing, everybody is aware that this is the uber issue of our time. It's not just uh, threatening uh, Western societies with rising sea levels and storms and floods and hurricanes and desertification. It's the movement of people that this is going to push. Now it's going to link to our immigration of the future. Certainly the number one factor driving refugee movements will not be man-made wars, but we're already seeing it, but it's going to skyrocket over the next few decades uh, by huge factors. I think 10 or more, uh, mo the most refugees will be climate related uh, movements. And those will all have an overlay with conflicts of tomorrow. So to the sooner we you know, start to realize all this uh, backlash in um, the United States and many other countries rising nativism and, and pu putting up walls and linking it to their immigration policies, you know, the US wouldn't even participate in the Marrakesh meeting last month that was trying uh, to improve international cooperation and show that the receiving countries obviously have an obligation but you know, until you connect the dots, and 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 climate is a whole set of issues. We're going to pull out of the Paris Agreement. We're we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. But back to the issues that that are at the core of this chapter on peace building and peacekeeping. You know, that should be a motivating factor, besides some of the other factors I mentioned with China and Western countries, why they put money in these uh, uh, um, uh, fragile states and try to prevent the, uh, try to avoid the recurrence of violent conflict. Another factor should be, you know, they're trying to limit the numbers uh, seeking uh, refugee status or, you know, become uh, economic migrants to their country. That should be a, a huge reason because if you address issues at their source, surely they'll, they'll be a lot less costly than um, what we're seeing when we need to spend not five billion. It's going to cost much more to build the border wall and to maintain it and keep it up. So I think we can connect the dots to uh, precisely the issues in this chapter, if people see there's another way out. So let, a follow up to that is uh, you know, if we could decide what we want, you know, as, uh, community organizers call it cutting an issue, you know, something small that we want, which we could push for, not all that we want, but, uh, you know, something that is uh, this opening uh, provides some opportunity, We perhaps we could ask for what we want in a, in a uh, 
in that context in some small way that would be an attempt to reform the existing system, uh, perhaps through development aid, in the face of you know these these uh, all the attention that the the immigration crisis is giving uh, provides some leverage. And if we could be clear about let's try this, you know, a proposal, then we could, that was a little bit actionable, we could then go through the networks that we're already a part of. Uh, uh, for example, we're in a Christian life community network here in Cincinnati, and it's an NGO of the United Nations. We could, we could try to make that functional if we had an actionable issue that we could say this is what we want. Great, very brief response, because I know um, uh, Nancy had a time limit for the whole program. And just to say, Nancy, I've addressed all the issues I wanted to cover from the study guide, and including in reference to what we've done in the albright Gambari Commission. I, I made enough references to um, how we build on Joe's thinking. But to finish uh, the point on immigration in a small step, you know, let's all admit that this is such a manufactured crisis. The, it's not uh, levels that we haven't seen in previous decades. And, uh, it, but it, it's a serious issue for Central Americans. And, it, and it, it could be resolved by us saying, hey, we signed the refugee convention. I think that was from the 50s. Uh, and we have an obligation to hear these people and, and their cases. And no, we have a legal system. We don't have to accept them all. But um, you know, in a humane way, we have an obligation to deal with them. That, that can only get us so far. I mean. It, we do need comprehensive immigration reform in this country, but that's a whole nother separate debate. What I would argue uh, would be an activity that could um, do some good and link to the UN and global governance and themes we care about and things that, at the heart of this chapter in Joe's book that we're discussing is something like a, uh, a, a mini Marshall Plan to make it more <laughs> palatable for uh, Central America. Let's go big in addressing economic and social uh, inequality and criminality and political dysfunction at the root. Uh, again, we all know it's not Mexico. It's not even it's not even Venezuela, which is going through a horrific crisis. There are numbers coming into the U.S. from Venezuela, but it's small compared to these three main countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. It's not even uh, Nicaragua, which is facing some real difficulties at the moment, many of people are following. So it's those three countries through the UN, uh, some of the ideas that Joe's talking about with the Administrative Reserve Corps, although we don't have to use that terminology, but going big in helping these countries grapple with very real governance problems and economic development challenges. Um, I'll finish by saying, and these are longer reign, range things and, and trade deals are not popular at the moment, but we just updated a NAFTA, I guess. But let's not forget that uh, linking our economies together helped Mexico so much. And then that was a chief factor for why uh, it's not uh, uh, having the desire to have so many immigrants come from Mexico today. Uh, yes, people move freely across the border for seasonal work. That's different. But what we're talking about are people you know, fearing for their lives and not having and having total desperation and not having economic hopes. This is what the UN is designed. It needs to be the last great hope for the most vulnerable populations of the world. This is a measure of who we are as an international society, as Americans. And I, so I think a great initiative, a mini Marshall Plan of something that utilizes the UN capabilities on the ground, Spanish speakers from around Latin America, around the world, who can bring their skills to bear and help these countries perhaps uh, we should be saying, okay, if we all agree that there's a crisis, even though there's questions about that, let's do something about it that's positive, that's in line with our values uh, and, and that the UN is designed to do. But the way things are set up now, the UN gets voluntary funding. So the US will need to up the ante, show some leadership as it has done in previous decades and, and rally the international community around this so-called crisis. This is Ron Glossop. I have a question. I've been reluctant to ask it. It's still something I want to bring up. And that is, what if instead of focusing so much on the UN and UN Peace Force, what about the possibility of taking advantage of the International Criminal Court? And this new way, instead of trying to get after groups of people, 
let's focus on individuals and see maybe could the International Criminal Court have its own police force, not a peace force, but a police force that could go after individuals. I know it's always going to be complicated because of the politics, but what about that whole new way of going after international conflict? And I'm quickly going through, uh, maybe in chapter seven, strength and judicial system, you have to tell me, uh, Nancy, does Joe get at the ICC and ways of strengthening it? In the albright Gambari Commission report, we absolutely agree with what you said, uh, uh, Ron, and, and I believe Maya might concur. Uh, you know, one, some of the pitfalls you immediately face, uh, major countries haven't signed up to the statute or ratified it. And, uh, and uh, now, because Africa feels like they're under the uh, microscope on the use of the ICC, there's talk of others pulling out and stuff. So we have to get a universal ICC uh, and, and that it becomes this deterrent factor because, you know, under Pacific Settlement of Disputes that we've been talking about, Article 33, Chapter 6 of the UN Charter, absolutely, the ICJ should be involved in dispute settlement mechanism. You run up against only a third of countries except the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. Well, the same pitfalls and difficulties face the ICC today. But were all countries to have signed up to uh the statute and 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 believe in the icc uh as a tool it can become this form of deterrence especially with the police force backing it up that you refer to i think uh most people argue what we write about is this is a responsibility for the security council both the apprehension of suspects and then the enforcement of icc decisions there needs to be uh, a, a policing element to that. And uh, there isn't one currently, there's probably not gonna be one that's standalone attached to the ICC base there in the Hague. Uh, there definitely would be a Hague Invasion Act that you might've heard in the United States <laughs> to <laughs> take uh, any uh, US nationals who are apprehended by the Hague. It, it, it's, it doesn't seem feasible that the police force element would be a standalone. It needs to be part of the UN proper, it needs to, be accountable to the Secretary General, to the Security Council, but that, that gets at some other bigger reforms that need to happen in tandem. But uh, absolutely, your thinking is right. The ICC, in terms of its uh, overall potential, we're only still in the infancy of this new creation started uh, two decades ago. Thank you. I'd love to hear from uh, Richard, the last part you talked about, if we have time, if we're gonna have time, this is the time, David? Yeah. I, I'd like to suggest that the mini Marshall Plan for this three Central American country sounds like a fantastic idea. Maybe we can continue discussing that in the Google group by email. Flesh it out a little bit and see if we can sell the idea of the mini Marshall Plan. As, as I understand, the Marshall Plan was mainly funded by the United States, wasn't it? Loans, it wasn't a UN kind of thing, right? They, uh, <coughs> Richard? Yeah, yeah, that's my understanding. Uh, 48, yeah. remember the major factor was uh, countries moving into the red camp, uh, yeah. the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, but a lot of the assistance that came from the US, loans and technical assistance, they became the forerunners of both USAID but also uh, UNDP and many UN agencies. So a lot of talent was built up, but, but uh, yeah, you don't have to link it to this chapter and, and the UN per se, that will actually make it less palatable in the US context. But if we wanna do something good vis-a-vis -vis the people of Central America today, everybody recognizes the language of a Marshall Plan, calling it mini might make it you know, more acceptable because the costs are, are perceived to be lower. But the intention is, address the issues at the source so there isn't this uh, push factor. And of course, you want the U.S. to be a pull factor. We've been seeing so many quotes by uh, President Reagan in the last few days of the country that is the beacon on a hill. And we want it to be country people want to come to because it's a role model country where they can feel accepted and stuff. We want that to be a part of America's identity. We're a country of immigrants. You got to keep reminding people. But to be pragmatic in this current highly politicized atmosphere, uh, 
I, I think it could be acceptable to the right, maybe even the far right, uh, and certainly the left in this country to uh, get behind helping the people of uh, Central America directly. And I want to point out that uh, Mac sent a uh, comment under the group chat. He says, Takun's global Marshall Plan work provides an example of what we are discussing about the three Central American countries. And he has a link here. So I'll send that out to everyone. I mean, I heard Mac saying it would be great if we could kind of get around a, a concrete Proposal. You know, send message that we're trying to send out and to share with the various, you know, peace and justice communities or whatever groups we're involved with. So I think that's great. And very interestingly, the environment, you know, climate change came up as we were discussing things here, and then the ICC and the judicial system. And those are the topics for the next two months of this book club. So I think this discussion is going to really naturally flow into next month toward a sustainable planet and an expanded common heritage. <laughs> J. Drake Hamilton, Carol, I know you know of her, any of you who don't know of her, even though she works about five blocks from my condo here, um, so she's in the Twin Cities, she's you know really a global expert on climate change. And so it's gonna be wonderful to have her here. She's certainly, uh, you know, let's get things done for, you know, first, um, import and she does get some really important things done so that'll be a great continuation and then the following month we're discussing the judicial system our final month we're kind of trying to tie everything together getting there so we're talking about practical ways to really you know take everything we've been learning and make it something that we can you know get our hands on so i think this was a great way to end the discussion uh, richard i gathered that you had nothing further to share about well, just if there, <laughs> it's great talking to this group that I've been affiliated with and, and, and probably so for decades and that it's an activist organization that wants to take action on certain issues. If you go with the mini Marshall Plan, I'll just throw out one other idea. It's great to focus on Central America, this current crisis, but since the question started with immigration more broadly, let's not forget the Muslim ban. What an assault on our uh, national identity that is if it succeeds in the courts. I, I think it's uh, questionable where it's going today, but it's going to come up again, certainly in the context of the election. And then it's no surprise that the countries being banned are, are caught up in conflicts in the Middle East. They're Yemen and Syria, I believe Somalia is in that case. And and so why not, um, how you formulate this mini Marshall Plan, maybe target a few regions that link back to our so-called immigration crisis in our country but let's not forget this horrible, horrible idea of a Muslim ban and uh, what that really represents. And link it to, we're all in agreement uh, across our country that something needs to be done in these countries. And if it's not the UN better equipping it to address them, you know, just talk about US diplomatic and development assistance. And part of that is always uh, working with international partners, working with the UN. Uh, so we can, uh, you know, both advance this UN strengthening revitalization transformation agenda, which is at the heart of Joe's book, while addressing head on one of the biggest issues in our body politic today, the, uh, the manufactured immigration crisis. Thank you so much. I think we could discuss more. Tom Hastings, can you let me know, is everyone who's part of our um, e-group, the book club e-group, able to send comments to everyone else yeah, i believe so you just send but we should put it in an e email message to say yeah e so i'll is for the google group yeah let's do that i think that would be great because there's so much follow on maya has some comments to make from the beginning of our discussion mac and ron maybe many of you have some further things to share um you know, based on our discussion here. And as I said, it really flows very well into the next discussion. So rather than only seeing each other once a month, and of course people come and they go on this, in this book club here, um, we could have some continuity by starting to communicate by email in between. So I'll send out that link and any of you can feel free to send comments. Um, Wonderful. Great. One of, the, one of the beauties of the Google group email is that if you can go back and see all the mail, email that's been sent uh, before you joined the, the Google group. So Okay, good. Great. We haven't really utilized as, that as we could have. This is our
sort of first foray into a book club business and by Zoom. <laughs> we're, we're learning things about how we could do it better. And, and actually, after we finish this book, Citizens for Global Solutions here in the United States is planning to continue a book club. They'll be choosing some other books after this one. So um, with that, Richard, thank you so much for joining. I don't know how we could have done this topic without you. It was extremely helpful. And each one of you who participated, you really made it a rich experience. So thank you so much. And we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good seeing all of you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for letting me join you.